Oh, you know, uh, Eloise, uh, I'm grateful you're here because I, ha I, you know, honestly, there's a great debate going on in my head. And I, of all the people I know in this world, and, and of course, you and I, uh, we've, we've never met in person uh, except in third grade uh, when we were having delusional ideas that we knew each other and were talking, but people were like, who are you talking to? And you're like, my future friend. Yeah. You know, I, I, I will spent have a like six months in therapy because of you. So, yeah. And then you met me. I you were like, And you're like, it was real. I'm a, yeah. I'm a psychotic. Uh, <laughs> it's just, that's how I feel. That's the only way I get my characters out is I, I feel like they're talking to me. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and uh, instead of just saying I'm a creative, and then, like, if they don't talk to me, that's my reason for sitting on the couch for eight days without writing. I just, I just put it out there. I go, you know, they're lazy. It's not me. Yeah, yeah. They're, they they're just don't want to like, operate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't, don't just make me a conduit. Like, do something, people. I need to write this book. Um, okay. But, but the the thing, I, the thing I, I, I was uh, actually interested in in discussing uh, uh, is is uh, what do you, what are your thoughts really on on this position? Okay. This is the position. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm nervous. <laughs> you know, it's, it's business. It's business talk. Okay, right? okay. Um, so you're in a bed. All right. So uh, the, the <laughs> <laughs> that's my other business, Thomas. We're not talking about that in this one. <laughs> well, put that to bed. I meant that's what I was trying to say. Uh, now the position is, uh, you know, there are self-publishing authors, and then there are uh, traditional publishing authors, also known mm -hmm. as the trads. Mm -hmm. um, However, uh, the position I'm going to present to you is that I feel uh, through my 20 plus years of observation and being in the industry as a uh, professional, uh, I feel that self-publishers uh, approach the business side, the marketing side, uh, with a misconception, a misconception of the process in advertisement and marketing. And uh, it, it de it's detrimental to their sales because what is the average sale for the lifetime of a book for a self publisher? What is it, a hundred to a thousand copies? If you're lucky, it's, it's not like very much. A hundred, right? Yeah, it's <laughs> it's crazy, right? It's well, yeah. Uh, so again, my my position that I would like uh, like your thoughts on is that self publishing authors, uh, unbeknownst to them, because they don't know, and therefore mm -hmm. it is a misconception, approach marketing and advertisement. Uh, with a limited mentality of the process and the system, uh, leading them to, and I should say, uh, the mentality uh, where they focus mainly on, well, social media. I'll just post and post on social media. Uh, I don't have a lot of money, so I'll just do free until I start making money with book sales. And then they don't spend money really on target analysis and market analysis. And uh, they, they think they think engagement means sales, but in reality, they don't understand engagement has something. It has something to do with the long-term uh, uh, consequences in a good way, because consequences good or bad. Uh, what are your thoughts on that position? Just just to start the conversation off. Oh, I completely agree with you. That um, I mean, authors in general aren't inherently business people. They they get into it to write, and then they hope to make it a business out of it. Usually. Um, so it doesn't surprise me, and I completely agree with you that self-published authors aren't inherently good at marketing or understand concepts of marketing, probably haven't necessarily taken a marketing class, which, I mean, I, I took one like 10 years ago, and uh, <laughs> I'm sure none of it applies anymore, whatever I can remember from it, but um, yeah, I just... The, that conversion rate that you're talking about, the engagement, I think it's only like 10% of your followers even potentially buy your, your books or your product. So trying to find, they're, they're trying, not only are they not necessarily knowing what to do and all these different people, the resources are trying to tell them what to do, but it all is, is either too overwhelming or too complicated or too expensive. And so they're trying to find the most affordable way to do it, which is why most of them go towards the free sides of social media or newsletter promotion and things like that, um, because they just don't have the funds for those targeted ads. And then they don't necessarily know what to do with the information that they get from, you know, they have that targeted ad and is it correlated to the sales that they get? 
If so, you know, how can we change this and improve it? Um, or figuring out where they don't, they don't necessarily have that methodology going into it with a method. They're just kind of spaghetti at, a, at the wall. And I'm saying that as someone who is also, <laughs> I also have no idea what I'm doing. So it's just like, buy my book, please. <laughs> I'm right. I'm, I, I'm right there with them, but, uh, trying to figure out how to have a strategy before I really start throwing money at it. Well, would you, would you, uh, would you enjoy to try maybe a thought exercise on uh, maybe approaching something? Sure. Uh, so let's start off uh, because, uh, and this is zero offense to you, but the audience will probably relate to your position on how you market more so than if I said something first, because, uh, you know, again, I've been in this, I've been in the industry. Yeah. You, you know uh, what you're doing. You yeah. I got, I, do. <laughs> I, I got, I got all people holding my arms and hands and saying, stop doing what you're doing, do this. And I was like, no, you're stupid just because you're successful. And I, you know, <laughs> it took me years to get out of my own way, which by the way, you know, it has to do with the artist and the business brain, you know, the artist brain sometimes thinks if my thing doesn't make me money, then I'm not successful on the merit mm -hmm. of my, and it's like, yeah, it's not necessarily true. Like, you know, there's more involved in that, you know, but uh, ultimately, all right, let's start, let's start off like, what is one thing you believe? And by the way, I'm using the word believe because it is how you approach it. I'm not I'm not using the word believe as in like it's the wrong way or the right way. I'm just let's let's get from your perspective. What's one way you believe is uh, the marketing way, like just one concept of marketing like you, you go, this will help me if I do this thing, I will see a return on my effort. Um making making short form video content that's how i've been hearing all of the you know the ro those romanticy books they get they go blow up because someone made this one reel and it went viral and it's like ah do i have the time and energy for that no <laughs> <laughs> like i got i got other things to do you know i got to eat i got, I got so food. many other things to do yeah you know just i have to nap mostly yeah. um to, to, to uh, kind of uh, not grandize it, but uh, expand on the idea, uh, you tell me if I'm right or wrong on what you're suggesting, just so the audience could kind of like uh, grasp it. Uh, you're saying make a uh, video reel, specifically probably TikTok and or shorts on uh, or even Instagram, right? Um, and in doing so, that, re that small reel, that video would either A, pertain to the book in some way or B, represents some sort of expertise, uh, or C, uh, is just community-based where it allows people to start a conversation uh, on a subject. Is that what you're saying when it comes exactly. to those videos? That's exactly what I'm saying. All right. Uh, if, so if I may. I, Thomas. What? I said you're so perceptive. <laughs> it's like you're well, bigger than something. <laughs> My, my mother told me once, don't don't uh, uh, suspect you know what somebody means until you are able to articulate it back to them and get a confirmation, yep. Uh, yep. right? Because perception is the reason we get into fights, you know, because it's like, you said these words and I that's what I believe those words mean. So therefore you meant this thing, but I like to clarify, yep. you know, uh, <laughs> it's debate 101. Um, all right, so with that though, uh, when you approach this, all right. Uh, now that we have uh, qualified the, your uh, your your uh, understanding of the uh, the videos, uh, when you approach this, how what is your main objective? Uh, to to reach my target audience. Hypothetically, I haven't actually successfully done the thing that I want to do, <laughs> but uh, the you know get it make it engaging. So um, people are wanting to interact with it, people are getting excited about the thing within the video. So they are potentially sharing it with other people, um, commenting on it, because we know that liking and commenting and engaging with the posts helps the algorithm. Um, <laughs> algorithm. Freaking algorithm. Um, but that that's primarily the um, not uh, ideally i don't want to uh bring engagement in through like the outrage engagement right there's people that make yeah. those those baby kind of um 
reels and content that are purposefully meant to outrage because a outraged comment is still a comment and there you go you know yeah like when people show the notebook and go this is the worst book ever <laughs> exactly <laughs> give me my okay, engagement he's holding up like a spiral bound notebook <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right, so let's 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 kind of jump into it. Let's let's really go into this. So, um, when it when it comes to the engagement, because I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. I, I'm not stating this as this is the only way or the right way. I just I just sort of want to hear your thoughts on it, sort of as uh, like an outsider to the concept, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, when approaching uh, this material, uh, there is actually a method that isn't about your target audience when you're starting off because there is no target audience when you're starting off meaning like you haven't really developed a brand that has mm -hmm. a message unless if you're thinking about the book that is a brand but it's not your brand so your right. author brand is what i'm talking about i'm not talking about books because if you focus on a thing you actually fail before you succeed and the reason is because you're not selling the thing that matters because you're the one who's going to write a different book but if you only write the same book over and over again then you can obviously do uh, you know, the same book, but, but, but the idea is who are you as the brand, right? So, uh, the target audio, like one of the things, one of my mentors taught me, uh, in the music industry, which kind of related to everything I did, uh, is that it's not our job to tell this person and that person that they fit the avatar we created who would buy our thing. Our job is to present our truth to the most people and allow them to connect to it emotionally. And that truth can be anything. It could be our missions, which is how we get involved with the communities, be it uh, for authors, it would actually be the community of other authors. Uh, the pushback I get on that is some people say, no, you want readers because they're gonna buy your book. And you go, you're not there yet though. You haven't earned the right, you need authors. So you can start getting into their co communities and then more authors help more authors. And then the next thing you have is, why you have band successful because there's multiple bands doing tours together there's actors and directors and writers coming together and working on projects together and they're doing it for free just to get right so mm -hmm. if you think about it in the same way with everybody it's like well let's get together with people who have the same passion and dreams and i can learn from them they can learn from me we can make mistakes we can you know assimilate and do whatever we got to do to to learn and grow uh but you know a lot of times authors are like well this is a single person game you know, it's me at a table with my characters and it's all about, it's me, 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 me. Not that, that they're thinking that way per se, but it's like, mm -hmm. who's around us when we're writing, right? But it's, it really should be about a bigger game. Uh, so when it comes to those videos, a lot of times they focus on say things. So they focus on like, let's talk about a subject. And then it's like, all right, the next video will be, here's my book. And then the next video is like, did you hear what happened with the notebook? Right. Like, and they're not really presenting a brand or a style. Mm -hmm. And if people connect to who you are as a truth, that's when they start supporting you. And the support is really the power. You said something really uh, exciting earlier where you said the 10% the rule. Um, the, the tradition of that rule in marketing, uh, uh, in, the, in the study of marketing is it's 10%, 10%, 10%. So it's 10% of your audience becomes aware of you, the 10% of the awareness becomes interested, and ultimately the 10% of those interested buy into it. So basically it's the, if you have 1% of your audience, quote unquote, you're successful, mm -hmm. right? But again, if you're only reaching a thousand people, right. you're guaranteed one sale if you're continuously showing those same thousand people uh, uh, some sort of attention. What do you, what are your thoughts on that concept? <laughs> I feel like you threw a bunch of concepts at me, all of us. The one that stuck out the most to me though, was your, um, you were talking about the bands and the concerts. And I think that's such a great, um, way to explain why it's important to have that community with other authors is because there's so many bands that were probably at one time a cover or not cover a opener for a bigger band and the whole reason why people found out about them is because they opened for i don't know rolling stones or something um and the 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 larger more successful band is helping them 
reach that other audience. So having those, um, the author collaborations and, you know, appearing on each other's streams, even if we're still just talking about writing, it will be a, uh, you know, some little guy like me hanging out with other people that have a bigger audience that will obviously benefit me more than that other person. And I think that's one of the tricks is um, convincing but, but you don't even, if you're a good person and the person just likes you, and that's what you're getting at, Thomas, is that being that genuine, authentic self, and then it doesn't matter if I have 100 subscribers and, you know, you have 20,000, if we are chummy on a authentic, real level, you don't care if I'm not really bringing as much to the table because we just have a good time talking to each other and bullshitting and just, you know, talking about stuff. Um but I, I do think that focusing on, I completely agree with you, focusing on selling yourself, but not in a like a weird, gross way, obviously. Like I said, that was, uh, that's my other business. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, my husband wishes. Uh, um, <laughs> but finding... And it's funny because I um, was working on writing something for another author friend of mine talking about author branding and coming up and how um, you come up with kind of your own branding. And I had such trouble with this. I ended up hiring a branding photographer and her like pre shoot questionnaire was really what got me to like realize, oh, OK, these are like the five things that I care about and want my brand of Eloise Barr to like represent, you know, I'm really nerdy about Greek mythology and writing and like tarot and being a mom and, you know, just being a weirdo. Um, so, <laughs> and this is probably one of the reasons why I haven't really actually executed on those short form video content ideas is because I want to have an even kind of, you know, a video on this, a video on that, kind of spread it out. Um, I'm really good at making plans on paper of what to do. <laughs> My issue is the actual finding time for the execution. Um, but sorry. Um, yeah. No, I, get it. I don't I know get if it. I answered yeah. your question. <laughs> hey, hey, it was, hey, you, you said something. That, that's, that's all that. <laughs> You know, there was this thing um, back in the day. I had a, I, had, uh, I brought some comedians together for you know because I was a stand-up comedian, and uh, uh, it was called Top of the Bottom Pile: The Best of the Worst, Your Second Best Choice, right? Uh, all, all brand. I like that. Thank you. Uh, so I brought them together, and I said, "Listen, guys, uh, uh, we tried to get girls involved, but we smell so bad they didn't they wouldn't want nothing to do with it. But they were more than welcome to get involved." But, <laughs> Uh, anyway, so I was like, listen, guys, uh, the first rule is that we are not going to perform for at least a year. That's what I told them. I go, we're going to work on our sets and stuff like that together, privately. We're going to hone. We're going to listen to each other. We're going to give some critiques. We're going to, you know, we're all writers. Let's kind of get the wording down. Let's practice until it's like something that we we know and we're not not reciting, but we're living Right. So it seems like it's new every time. And like, don't we need an audience to see if it's funny? I go, not right now, because you don't have to be good yet. We're not even you know, you're not there yet. And they go, well, why can't we perform for a year? I go, if somebody asks us to perform, we can perform. But we're not going to go out to ask people for performance slots. And we're not going to put on shows because we're not promoters. We're going to be comedians and writers. And part of that is because we're going to eventually try to get people to hire us, not because we ask, but because they see our skill uh, elevating one another, et cetera, et cetera. So within six months of being within the community of the comedy scene, not only were we being asked to play on real shows, like not just like we did. Our rule was no open mics. It was only shows because that's the only way you're going to get an audience to respond to comics. They they watch your stuff with their phone like this. They're like looking at their phone and like, are you done with the set? You know, like they don't care about you, right? So yeah, we, we were getting on shows and then also APA management contacted us at the time because they had heard about top of the bottom pile. We hadn't performed 
Like we weren't like a top of the bottom pile. We just focused on the three things that really led to our success, which was network market practice. We focused on building and cultivating relationships within the community and did what we could to help them out without asking for anything in return. Uh, then we established the brand, which was if we came around, you know, we were good people. We, we, again, we help people. That's part of the brand. That's part of the mission. Uh, obviously we, we're self-deprecating because we're top of the bottom pile with the best of the worst, you're saying, right? So we didn't take ourselves seriously. And, but more importantly, we didn't just practice comedy. We practiced the understanding of the industry. So what did that mean? If somebody had questions, we were able to answer that or direct people where they needed to go. And we became a force. Um, you know, obviously, uh, I, if you don't know my story, I ended up getting cancer closer towards a certain point and we we all kind of went our own ways but that first year was just and this is what the reason i bring this up is because when it comes to marketing it's not about the thing like stand-up comedy would have been the thing like if we did jokes like if we went on stage that would have been our book right and uh, when i see authors and the reason self-published authors specifically when i see them focusing on like the book I, you know I'm like, hey, good for them. They're putting their energy into something. You know how hard it is just to come up with an idea, let alone write the idea, let alone publish the idea, let alone, right? Like to get to, <clears throat> I have a book is the hardest thing in the world. And, you know, the respect that it takes to get there uh, for people that just wish they could be like, I wish I could write a book that doesn't get published. I just, I, and they're, they're inspiring me to, right? But the idea, that the book is what's going to make them money and they don't put that kind of effort into developing those relationships developing that brand what because like like you write your writing is really good like i i i checked out your writing on, you. on, on the previews right but but you're not the writing no you you know what i'm saying you're not you're not uh and this doesn't give anything but you're not a greek goddess you're not you know you know well you may be you may be you ask <laughs> Well, you know, <laughs> now that would be a crazy OnlyFans shooting lightning and stuff like that. Does she just shoot lightning at her ass? Um, but more importantly, you know, and it has a beautiful cover, like the stylization of the cover of your book and, and, and uh, the, the color choices and the design itself, like the way the art looks. That is a brand, but it's not you, right? right. So when I, I always look at self-publishers, and I definitely want to get your thoughts on this, but I always look at self-publishers. And, and I go, I wonder why they put so much effort, not in writing the book, because that's, I get that. That's, yeah. there's no question of that. But why do they put so much effort in the book being the thing that's going to help them succeed if at the end they end up just going, well, that ran its course. Let me write the next book and we'll try again. And it's right. like, you know, the definition of insanity based on the uh, society's uh, uh, venture into the, uh, the obscure is ultimately if you know insanity is doing the same thing over and over again expecting different results right right so what are your thoughts on that i think they get caught up in the fact that they're trying to push a product and have that idea of they're trying to get the product in front of as many people as possible and so they just keep pushing that product look at this look at this look at this and you know you like if you if they have only traditional commercials to go off of that's essentially what i mean millennials and i don't know at what point people stopped regularly watching cable and getting inundated with the same commercial every five minutes you know every commercial break it's like the same three or four commercials that you just see again and again and it's not really like at face value yeah it's the product yeah. and i'm sure that the the companies are trying to push that reputation and that brand like all the in stupid insurance companies and things like that um it's called so, imprint marketing by the way right well the, it's such it, it's what they see the most and maybe what they think of off the top of their head when they think of oh marketing and all that stuff or looking at the successful or even comparing themselves to traditionally published books and they're seeing oh this book you know, this author that's traditionally published, they're putting out these kinds of reels or images or media. I need to do that too, but it's not necessarily the same thing because 
they've got all sorts of other marketing teams behind them that the publishing house is going to these stores to do X, Y, and Z, as opposed to them going out, you know, and meeting those local bookstore owners and making those and fostering those relationships. There's that saying with marketing of it's like, it's not what you know, it's who you know, but you mm -hmm. know, not in trying to get ahead, but just making those connections, like what you were saying. I completely agree. Um, yeah, I feel like I don't have a lot of that's okay. Do you know who uh, Paul yeah, Rudd is? Because I agree with you on so many of them. <laughs> <laughs> Just like, yeah, what Thomas said. Yeah. <laughs> my thoughts are his, <laughs> but yeah. they're my own too. I don't know. <laughs> it's that third grade uh, thing. <laughs> just, I've just we've been connected since the third grade. Yeah, so uh, we, we were uh, destined to be crazy together. Yes. Um, so I, I know you know who Paul Rudd is, but let's uh, let's do the bit. Do you know who Paul Rudd is? No, who's he? <laughs> he's about this tall. Sometimes he's a little bit bigger. He's Ant Man. Uh, oh. he, he's a Jewish a Jewish gentleman that hides it very well. Does he though? <laughs> Does he? Well, not anymore. I just take one look at his nose. Is that this, oh, this a one. <laughs> well? He could be Italian. You don't know. It's just okay. silly. Okay. Okay. Uh, Zach Galifianakis had one of the funniest jokes about him. He goes, uh, you know, something about him being like, you know, what's your secret to uh, being such a, uh, um, what's your secret to hiding your Judaism so well in your career? Like and like, you couldn't hold it in. Like he broke, he broke character. Like Paul Rudd was trying, <laughs> trying to hold oh, it Oh, on in. the between two ferns? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> I don't understand. Ah. I could never go into comedy. I got in so much trouble with my director when I was in Midsummer Night's Dream just because I kept yeah. laughing and the director would be like, stop it. <laughs> like, this is why I can't go into acting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but look at his tights. How can you not laugh at that? Uh, that's what you wear when you do uh, Shakespeare. You got to wear tights. I have photos of it online. <laughs> Two households, both alike in dignity and fair <laughs> All right, anyway. Uh, so Paul Rudd, funny story, uh, which is also poignant to what we're talking about. Before, before he was successful and before Clueless came out, he hired a PR company. All right. So, again, before he had any recognition, before, you know, you're still doing these bar mitzvahs and bar mitzvahs and like doing dj work and you know occasionally he would do like i, I know that's what he did he was he was a dj for bar mitzvahs and stuff and, and like uh birthdays and stuff uh um i'm a student of six i love studying you, the, the, you know you know who else used to dj at bar mitzvahs and bar mitzvahs who tiffany haddish <laughs> uh, <laughs> she was also homeless by the way i know she was a really interesting story Sorry. No, no, Sorry. No. And Kevin Hart helped her out financially. Anyway, so uh, he has some excellent books too, Kevin Hart. But so Paul Rudd hired a PR company. Not only did he meet his wife, who was his agent, meaning like she was assigned to him, but he hired a PR company. Now, there's a lot involved in that. And some people like it could be expensive. But like, again, do you put money into a business or do you not put money into a business? Like, you know, when I opened up my theater, I didn't just go there and just be like, I'll just start doing shows outside in the parking lot until I have enough money to rent the, you know, like there was a process, right? So um, save up the money is what I'm saying. You know, like it's something you have to do is hire a PR company. And the reason you do this is because not only do they help you with your public relations, they help you with interviews. They help get your scene, your face seen on morning shows, right? Because again, it's all about the 10% of the 10% of the 10%. So if a million people see you, that's different than a thousand people, right? Mm -hmm. So, but what happens on these interview shows is the PR company teaches you how to speak about ideas and not about the product. And you could do this as an exercise, literally go watch interviews with celebrities and how often do they talk about and say, go see my show, go see my movie, buy my book. The host does because they're mm -hmm. allowed to, mm -hmm. but the, the actual guest doesn't, but they'll talk about back behind the scenes on the movie. They'll talk about 
stories that will be in the book. So, for example, if it's a memoir, they'll be like, oh, yeah, when I was dating Angelica Houston, you know, there was this. Uh, it's actually in the book. And we, we, we did this thing and uh, we went to a party. Right. They they're very smart with it, you know, and authors would benefit it from uh, a great deal. Not only would they be able to start getting booked for, say, the speaking panels at, uh, at like cons or, or small, smaller conventions, things like that. But they also help you with getting some real press. The real press is important because reviews are opinions. But what you say is a fact, unless, of course, you make a claim. But it, the claim is like, this book is great. Like that's a claim that is not true. It can't be true because it's biased, right? It's subjective. But uh, <clears throat> but what you say is true. So if you start talking about, you know, the things you like, you can't. No one could say that's wrong, even if it's not true. You know what I'm saying? Like because it is your opinion is now true because I like the color purple. Like no one can fight you on that because it's literally. But if you claim something, purple is the best color in the world. Yeah. Now they can fight you, right? So. But anyway, uh, so that, that that's an interesting thing that Paul Rudd, just, just to bring it back, Paul Rudd hired a PR firm before he was Paul Rudd and before Clueless came out. Um, and, I, and I always wonder why, because again, he didn't have the money. It's not like he was rolling in money yet. He was still doing the bat mitzvahs, right? <laughs> so, right? It's like, why, why not save up the money? Why not save up three or four months worth of PR money? Just do the research. I'm not saying this to you. I'm talking about, I'm talking to the yeah. royal world. Uh, oh, you know, yeah. it's like save up the money, however long it takes, since you know the book. If your book is going to take a year to write, you have a year to save. Yeah. Right? Even if it's a little bit, like $100 a month would be $1,200 for the. So maybe that'll cover a small PR firm. Maybe it'll cover just a month, whatever it is. The idea is like, how do I prepare for the real marketing? How do I go beyond? social media because it's only so many times I, I i call it i call it the ratio rule you know if i do maybe four adventure posts which is like my, you know my life or my thoughts or my ideas mm -hmm. and then i can do like one push post where it's like right. oh, my book is available you know like you can ratio it out but if it's buy my book buy my book, <laughs> buy my book. yeah but if my book comes in <laughs> right right that gets that gets annoying and that will drive people away more than it will bring you in um yeah uh, uh, three th thoughts. <laughs> Go for it. Let's hear it. Uh, the first, the, what, what you were just saying was the hard sell versus the soft sell and the importance of that. I think to answer your question about why people don't necessarily save money for it is that they're, um, especially self-published authors, I am uh, doing this as a side gig. So, um, and self-published authors also have to save for all the other things. Um, even without the PR firm, my the amount of money I spent to publish from complete start to finish with my debut novel um, was about $5,000 because a big chunk of that was editing. And of course, this, this cover did not come cheap. That's why it looks so good. Um, so uh, I was saving, but it was all towards these things to actually produce the product. But so I agree with you to save because as an accountant, I'm a huge proponent of not going into debt over something like publishing a book. Yep. Um, but I think it also is a there's two other kind of thoughts with that is are you are the self published authors writing to actually make a full time living off of it and make it a business or is it a passion because the ones I that are more that. of a passion, like for myself, yeah, it would be super cool if I could be a full-time author one day, I'm probably not going to. Just because of this next reason that I'm going to say is when it comes down to it, being a author is not, if you are, if, if there are people that are claiming that they are a full-time author and that they are supporting themselves exclusively on their book sales, not coaching, not classes, I call bullshit because <laughs> <laughs> the number of copies and uh, to the number of copies that um, you have to sell in the book's lifetime to even recoup the cost of publishing the book. Yeah, I'd have to sell like eighteen hundred ebooks 
to even <laughs> make back the money I put into it. Not to mention yeah. be able to pay my bills and all this other stuff. So, uh, yeah. which is where also the concept of the 20 books to 50 K kind of thing comes from is if, mm -hmm. if you're wanting to make gross $50,000 worth of sales in a year, you need to have at least 20 books published and out there to rely on each of those, instead of having to sell 1800 copies of just one book, you yes, yeah, compound it. interest. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so obviously then you have the different revenue streams and stuff, but as far as why, uh, the self-published author, you know, I might consider investing in a PR firm once I finish the series and I really want to push the whole series and more books and like that. But at the moment it's like, I can't even, <laughs> I'm busy saving for that next book. I can't, I can't even like, I'm never going to make this money back at this rate. I'm just like, but I feel like Tiger King. I'm never going to financially recover from this. <laughs> so, so I completely well, agree with you that investing in a PR firm, having professionals tell you what to do and coach you at the very least, maybe a coaching session if you're, you know, not wanting to hire them like full time would be, um, it would be a valuable, obviously a reputable PR firm, not just some person who cold calls you on Instagram. <laughs> I saw your book. I'm a PR person. Hire me. I get those S do you get those SEO guys all the time? They're like, oh, I see your channel. Your videos are very nice, but your SEO. Let me show you how you can improve. Here's screenshots. And look, your face is wrong here. Pay me it's very hundred. nice. Uh, I tell them my SEO is too good if they're finding me. I gotta make it worse. <laughs> I, uh, there's a couple of things you said that I really love, and I agree wholeheartedly. For the record, everything I'm saying is based on people who make the decision, I want to make a living doing this, mm -hmm. not you know anyone who's a hobbyist. I, I, yeah. I have zero advice for you when it comes, <laughs> you know, like do anything you do is correct. You know, like you're happy making Are you model having airplane. a good time? Great. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I I have zero critiques. I have zero advice. You. Yes, you're supposed to do exactly what you're doing. Uh, but at the moment, somebody like, you know, especially back in the day, like when a musician's like, I want to make a living doing this. And I go, well, stop doing what you're doing and start getting into the rooms, you know? Yeah. And they're like, no, I'm going to just become great at guitar and write my own music. And you're like, you'll never, no one will ever talk to you, you know? And it's because no, no one cares. Ima imagine going up to somebody with a book, right? Like, let's say I have this book, right? And I go, hey, um, uh, read this book. It's great. And they're like, no. Yeah, but but if if you just read it, no, I don't want to. But yeah, yeah, but I wrote it. It's great. Yeah, I'm busy. Right? But they think because I wrote it and it's great, it will sell itself. And it's like, well, right. if people read it, well, of, course, of course if people read it. But that's the part you have. that That's not the part you're trying to get done. You're trying to get people to want to read it, not to read it. The re to read it, that's the easy part. You know what I'm saying? Because as soon as they got it, they're going to read it, you know, unless you're like me having a, a library of books and I just stare at them. But like, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it's the same thing with anything. So, but but uh, <laughs> what was the other thing you said that I really like? Uh, so you said the thing about uh, 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 hobbyists. Uh, hobbyists versus three professionals. So I talked about um, not actually being able to make money off of the books. Oh, the writer thing, the author thing. So. So I qualify myself as a full-time writer because uh, I'm not a full-time author. I'm a full-time writer because I write for other people. I, I do critique writing. I, you know, I write scripts. I write novels, I, but not just for myself. So I am a full-time writer, but I agree with your statement. Like if someone's like, I'm a full-time author. I mean, but honestly, one of the things that I was taught early on in the music industry is if you decide that you're going to make a living on music, then you'll never be metallic. And the reason is because Metallica doesn't make money on music. That is a small element of their business. And I say business because not only do they own their own record label now, but they own their own publishing company. They own their own studio to film documentaries and movies and finance, right? They, they have their own booking company that handles the touring, right? And that was something I learned early on is like, we shouldn't uh, cancel out the truth 
by saying, well, if we're not this thing, we're not that thing. And in reality, your job is to make multiple sources of income. So you have the power to do a very specific thing, mm -hmm. say no mm -hmm. or yes, because okay. a lot of people have to say yes to pay their bills, but that destroys your brand. And uh, in the in the movie industry, I used to say it to women all the time, especially like if they were working with me, I go, if you have to get naked for a part because it it pays stupid money, right? Mm -hmm. But that's not what you want. You have to say no. And they're like, yeah, but it pay. It, it's like those, those, uh, those TikToks where it's like uh, uh, somebody from India and they're talking like they talk because they don't have like the hysteria. And they're like, no, you got to do that. Don't believe you got to talk like this. And they're like, I'm not talking like that. And then they're like, it pays 70, uh, you know, 70,000. And they're like, I'm never going to and, but yeah, I get it. Yeah. You know, like the money's good. I'm going to compromise my brand. Right. Right. So, it, I, I agree and disagree with I agree that if you say you're a full time author and you're not making money as an author, you're not a full time author. But I disagree that you should only try to make money as a thing. Whereas when I was making money in music, it actually wasn't from music, it, from me playing my own music, even though I made money with that. It was money going on tour with somebody or money going into a studio for somebody or writing something for somebody. I used to write rap songs for people. And I, I'm a metal guy. I go into doom metal and, you know, singing high notes. And they're just like, I need a, I need a beat and I need some lyrics. And I, mm -hmm. cause I'm a poet, you know, and they're like, it's poetry. And I was like, all right, but I can't use any good words. And like, we'll put the good ones in, you know, <laughs> you know, uh, but anyway, uh, but so those are the two points I kind of wanted to push back on, uh, oh, you know, those yeah. ideas, but I agree with you, you know, in a sense. Yeah, I, I agree with the point of like, if it goes against your brand, especially in this day and age of digital stuff, like with the actress who like, she doesn't want to get naked, doesn't want that associated with her. But then for this one role she does, and then suddenly, you know, maybe from then on that those are the roles that she gets offered, you know? Yeah. Um, I agree with the being a full time, being a full time writer, completely agree. I think what I was thinking of were um, a couple of really big author tubers who claim that they're full time authors, but I know for a fact that they're actual like they're like, oh yeah, I fully support myself on my author income, and it's like, is it your author income or is it your YouTuber ad income and all of your brand deals and everything else that you're actually making the money off of? And I have an issue with that. Not because I have an issue with the revenue streams, totally get those revenue streams, make your money, yeah, yeah. be an entrepreneur. But I think it's super deceptive to the new authors who yes. have this unrealistic expectation where they look at this person who has three books out and they're like, oh, I, you know, made it big all by myself. It's like, good for you. Um, <laughs> I agree with you. No, you're right. Because you know, um, it's misconception. It's yeah. it's misleading. Yeah, it is. And that's, that's my biggest issue with it. And then the other thing that you mentioned about Metallica and with the music, um, because you're a metalhead, um, and the being going into the business of writing in that situation, you're almost like, um, I don't know if you know that Rammstein was like created to just be successful. Like they went out, yeah. not like, Ooh, let's make songs about, whatever the heck they sing about because i don't speak german but they're like let's go we are starting a band with the goal of being a very successful uh metal band and they were good at it and they did it so having that business and knowing as a writer and either writing to market which is kind of tricky in and of, of itself to with like chasing the market and trying to figure out market trends yeah. and things like that but i mean that's that's kind of where I'm accepting the fact that I'm not going to be that full-time author because I'm not writing to market. I'm writing about what I'm passionate about and I'm okay with that. Um, but, you, you know, know. Uh, not to push back Eloise, but uh, you know, some of the greatest authors of our time wrote against market and they changed the market because that's they true. wrote what was true to them. Yeah. So, uh, no bad, don't no down talking about your your quality it's, and greatness. It's like I'm. Not, I like my book. I write things that I like to read. 
that's, you know, it's like, okay, I want to write what I want to read because as much as I love the Greek mythology retellings and that niche, when I do read those books, I end up getting bored because it's all very purple and fluffy and pretty and la 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 when I want something more fun. Um, so yeah. finding that, like on one hand, writing to market, but not writing the same cookie cutter crap that already exists because then you're just going to be in the slush pile of everything competing against, you know, the stuff that does stand out. So look, you're lucky because you're not in the time period where you need a BM, a BTSM in your book just to sell it now. <laughs> so, you know, it, it was, it was twilight and then the 50 shades of gray and everyone's like, yeah, all right. About vampires and BTSM. I'll put it together. And then, then that like saturated the market. So at yeah. least, at least, you don't have to worry about that anymore because people are like, ah, we need less of that. Yeah. More well, story. I, <laughs> I do have a slight problem that like the my little very sub niche genre is already pretty saturated, and I've heard that like booktubers are already, you know, readers are like, oh, I'm tired of Greek myth and retellings, and I'm like, great, I'll just wait until you circle back around in ten years. <laughs> Tell them it's Roman mythology. Right. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> the um, Romans are a bunch of hacks. <laughs> I agree, because I'm Sicilian. <laughs> and us Sicilians are not Romans, and Romans are not Sicilians. No. Uh, as much as Italians are not, you know, Romans, technically. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact... The Italian language, Italia, uh, wasn't the original language uh, when Rome was an empire. It was Latin. It was a, mm -hmm. it was a factional Latin. That was, anyway, uh, Claris de Artis Spitnar. <laughs> I know very little Latin. Um, you know, uh, uh, going going into uh, writing and stuff like that, you know, it's funny when characters, uh, they won't click into the original ideas that we have. You know, like we're like, I have an idea for a character, you know, and then they start kind of like, getting off track and they do their own thing and they like push back a little bit and then you realize where they're pushing back sort of like where you're going it's like now i gotta like do a complete overhaul on that character uh, you know what i'm saying like uh, it's like i have this idea and then by the time you're done with it it's not that idea but you're like it's working yeah do you, do as you long as you're happy that? with it yeah but but do you do you find yourself going that way ever and then going i'm stopping the train now and I'm going to go back to what I originally had, or do you like to see sort of like where it's going? Do you play? Do you play with uh, uh, the movement? Um, I think I I'm somewhere in between because the characters in my uh, series right now, I I <laughs> I used to make these character sheets that were oh my god, dozens of pages long. Oh geez. <laughs> And their personalities were really, really specific. And I spent so much time like really like getting into their heads. But now, um, other than the main character, my side characters are kind of um, not caricatures, but it's like, OK, this is this is the bitchy one. This is the one, you know, and so they kind of ebb and flow. Um, and I, you know, they, I kind of keep them on their track. If I write a piece of dialogue that's like, oh, no, nope, that, that sounds too nice for this one to say. Let's, yeah, yeah. let's Too many foot it. fetish comments for this one. Yeah, yeah. Um, but <laughs> there, I, them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I do like to let them play, though, as far as, like, the dialogue and the interaction between them. Um, I have the idea of what I want to accomplish in the scene and how we're going to do that. But um, the the funniest one is in this the book two of the series that I'm working on. Um, well, this whole series, uh, my main character, I didn't know exactly what her sexuality was. I knew she would end up with this one character throughout the series um, because... The myths declared it so, um, <laughs> you know, that's the, the other fun thing about the historical fantasy and using the, the myths. It's like some of these things I can't really change easily. Um, <laughs> Zeus is Zeus. <laughs> right, exactly. But um, I wasn't sure if she was like hetero or bi or whatever. And then I started writing this one scene and I'm just like, oh, wait, are they are they going to kiss? 
Oh, oh, they're kissing. Oh, God. doing the typing and my brain's like, what is this? Ha- what is happening? But I was liking it. So, you know, a- as long as they're doing what fits with the scene and we're going in the right direction. Yeah, go, go have fun. But the minute yeah. you start trying to veer me off my outline, we're going to course correct. Because I spent too much time on that outline to just completely toss it. As long as they're not uh, meandering and they're only gallivanting, it's yes, fine. Yeah. Exactly. Now, are you? Do you allow your uh, Greek mythology characters to French kiss, or are you like, yes. look, we don't like the, the, the you know? I don't think gore, I, I, I don't gore. I don't use the term French kiss because obviously that doesn't fit with the times, but. <laughs> They start moving their hands and then they, well, French kiss, and then they look at each other's eyes <laughs> and give each other high fives. And then. <laughs> and then they hug. <laughs> and then they hug and dap one another. <laughs> <laughs> you ever write a word that just feels right, but then you're just like, this is not the right word to use. <laughs> mm-hmm. like, yep. You know, damn, modern yep. age. Oh my god! Yep, I have to really keep an eye out for that. I can't remember what's the. Oh, what was the one? Oh, I said like that's my cue, and my editor was like, <laughs> "Cue is too modern of a word." And I'm like, fine. Not if I'm talking about the letter. Yeah. Uh, Unfortunately, it wasn't. <laughs> yeah. Why is cue the letter not a word? Cue. But it is a word. Yeah, it is. Q is a very you know? perplexing letter. Yeah, it's uh, quite quite complex and perplexed. Uh, <laughs> come see our act every Saturday. Um, yeah, so uh, so that that makes sense. Yeah, because you, you don't want to you don't want to just throw words in there and just like oh they were in their tweens, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, <clears throat> yeah, I like. Uh, my original style of writing when I was a youngin mm-hmm. uh, was uh, very Shakespearean. And people were like, you can't write this way. I'm like, but they're from the Middle Ages. So I'm using like the Middle Age, you know, that kind the of. Twixt. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Nice <laughs> Twelve night before twiz. <laughs> and, uh, right. Um, and they were like, yeah, but it's difficult to understand. And I go, well, I, I, I understand that. I get that. But it was like the dialogue was written that way, but the narrative was written more concise and more. It was still had like a flowery touch to it, a lyrical yeah. Yeah. element to it. But uh, at the same time, the characters kind of were talking at a high intellect, even yeah. though they were, you know, they were idiots sometimes. But it's like you can't read Shakespeare and go, I get this. You have to like, what is he saying? You know, like. You know, it, it's There's just so many fun. characters in Shakespeare that are so stupid, though. It's so great. <laughs> but, you know, the thing is, uh, it's not English. Right. <laughs> it's English. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so it's like uh, it's a thing. But, um, you know, how, how long do you feel it took you? And obviously the uh, a writer's voice is constantly evolving. But mm-hmm. how long did it take you to feel like, you know what? I think I found my voice. Uh, uh, as a writer, because again, you know, when you first write, there are certain words you'll use a lot. There's certain f- ways you write, right? So that evolves, you know, just again, I evolved from that to a more refined, you know, style of writing. Um, when, when do you feel you discovered your voice as a writer, even though we know it's, it evolves? I was going to say, I'll, uh, get back to you when I find that out. <laughs> <laughs> Buy my book. <laughs> like, I don't know. I feel like I'm still finding it. Um, I think I think once I finished my first draft and I was rereading it to do my developmental edit and I was realized I, I was noticing that like, yes, I'm using um, vivid imagery language for my, um, what is it, prose, but not too much. I um, And then the dialogue's not as fancy pantsy um because i'm just assuming that people are it's like okay they're speaking greek but like in the 
not and the English fancy, tongue. And the not fancy way of speaking Greek, so I'm not going to have it be formal um, unless they're gods or something like that. Um, but reading it back and seeing, okay, I have this balance of like not overly flowery with, I, I want it to, I want my readers to be able to, as a reading picture, the scenes, if they have that kind of imagination, like a movie, yeah. um, but having that balance of not too much prose and dialogue, I don't know. And then the reviews that I've been getting in where it's saying, oh, it reads a lot like a YA. And I'm like, okay, I guess that's my style is like, I'm, I've got the adult content and I'm okay with that because to me, YA is like ex more easily accessible. And I think that's the yeah. difference between something like Cersei where Miller has a lot of really like pretty things that she's saying and it's pretty, but it doesn't necessarily tell you a whole lot of what's going on. Um, it takes a lot of room up on the page, um, but you can't really picture it easily where um, I'm going for the adult content, but being able to picture it easily and have it flow and um, yeah. faster and have that kind of almost play aspect with the dialogue of, you know, back and forth, not a lot of huge chunks of like, I'm going to have a soliloquy kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> and lots of air dashes. I'm sure my, I was driving myself nuts with trying to format that with my stupid smart quotes with my M dashes. And because everybody's <laughs> interrupting each other and not finishing a thought and stuff like that. So. Yeah, that's always fun too, because it's just like, hey, no, wait, I, I got to, so wait, uh, you know, and, yeah. and then you're like, oh, this doesn't make enough sense, you know. Yeah. Uh, I, I had a friend, I asked him, I go, you know what, because uh, I, I was asked to read his book and I was like, uh, you know, what, what, uh, is this genre? And I named a couple items, you know, idea categories. And then I was like, or, you know, is it the, he goes, I don't care, whatever the publisher says. <laughs> he goes, when it's done, if they want the book, they can say it's it's dark horror. I don't yeah. care. It just it just takes the book and do what you got to do. And oh I was like, God. that's fair. On one hand, that's nice because then you're not having to like put thought into it. But on the other hand, that can kind of screw an author because they'll write something and then the publisher advertises it as like a dark fantasy or a romanticy, and then it's actually horror, and then the readers get super mad because. Yeah. There's cannibalism or something. I don't know. Well, that's how you know you love somebody. You eat them up. So yeah. uh, <laughs> I, I eat them. Everything they do, I eat it up. Uh, yeah, but it also comes down to a publisher knowing. You know, <laughs> uh, they, uh, you know, a, a good publisher, obviously, any one of the top five is going to be able to go, you know, what will make this sell. Sometimes they'll actually put it in a category that has less competition but is closely mm -hmm. related to what it is. Um Something that I've been getting with uh, the first fantasy book because it's like uh, it's it's in the uh, beta reader stage. Mm -hmm. The uh, they're like the subversion is you think it's one genre or it's one trope, and then you realize it's none of those things, and the book becomes this very adult book. I mean, like the prologue itself has decapitations and trolls eating people. You know, like Excellent. and it's a romance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sounds like my kind of fantasy. Yeah, it's it's. There's a lot of uh. Well, the thing is, like the violence. I'm very descriptive with the violence because I want it to be seen through the main character's eyes. Mm -hmm. That because I hate reading a book where like you know a 16 to 18 year old character is like death, kill, 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 and they're not death. totally scarred by it. Yeah, like it's not. Now, as the books progress, depending on the characters, that'll become numbed. It won't be really something they're noticing or paying attention to. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, I like to write uh, because I I really started in, uh, you know, when I started like writing, writing, I started as a, as a script writer, a screenwriter. So I like write in the presentation of the character. So when you read the chapters, if it's the POV of that character, the reader is also experiencing things because what one of the funny things uh some writer was like you know uh i'm, I'm kind of confused in this moment like i don't know what's going on i was like yeah the character's confused <laughs> they don't have enough information. it's their pov they don't 
they're frightened. They're dealing with this thing and they're just trying to get there. Yeah, but I was getting anxiety from it. I go, good, good. That's what's on the page. And they're like, oh, shouldn't you make it like, shouldn't we as the reader know everything? I go, it's not omniscient. It's limited. It's third person limited, but it's still pure. And, you know, that's a fun way. I like to write that way. I don't get hired to write that way a lot. A lot of people just want it like straight, like to just write it straight. But like when I write it, if the character's feeling extreme fear, I write it with that sense. If it's extreme love, I write it. Uh, whatever whatever the feeling is, I, I like to put the character um, like I don't give away a lot of information if the character doesn't know, mm-hmm. you know. That's important, but that's a choice. That's a writer's voice, right? That's part of my writer's voice. Um, but yeah, it, it is violent. It's very violent. And people are like, oh, it's a coming of age book. And they realize by chapter seven, it is not a coming of an age book. Oh, no. You know? <laughs> and I'm like, exactly. You know? Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I get that. Yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. Uh, so, Eloise, uh, uh, by the way, uh, do you have anything uh, you want to tell the audience? Uh, you know, we're getting close to we got to we got to start wrapping it up. I know, I know, you said uh, you you had to uh, clean your feet or something. I don't know, foot fetish thing, but mm-hmm. uh, uh, for that other that other business, yeah. <laughs> I hired a monkey to do some of my own uh, ASMR uh, uh, grooming. Nice. So I just listened to it moving my hair, you know, That's and then. Nice. You know, yeah, it's very nice. Takes the fleas out. I have to put fleas in my hair <laughs> for the monkey to feel like you know. I was gonna say, working. Thomas, where does yeah, the, yeah. where does the monkey get the the bugs from? <laughs> well, the first time I didn't have the fleas, and the monkey's like, really? Like, I, I what appreciate. What am I supposed that. to do, Chris? Pick at your yeah. dandruff? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, I don't need an old man making me feel like I'm wasting my time. Um, does it bother you when the monkey gets down into your beard? No, no, that's actually. I just fall asleep. I, oh, you know, okay. you know, like, just get into it, you know. They slap me something. You know, <laughs> you, ever, you ever see him do that? You ever see him do that? I do that to my husband all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, BTSMD, uh, what is that? I can't even BS. BDSM. Yeah. Slap all the time. He loves CTM. He loves CTM. Right? Wait, is it TC? No, no, that's, uh, I don't know. BDSM? No, the uh, the ball torture. I forget what the, the acronym is. Oh, I don't There's know about that. Wait, dude, I'm slapping. Anyway, so hot. So, Eloise. Uh, I might have to incorporate that into my next book. <laughs> please, please. And uh, uh, also, I'll see you this Sunday at church. <laughs> <laughs> they don't let me in there. <laughs> yeah, the water keeps fucking evaporating. Yeah. Once yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. Um, I once went into a temple when I was younger. I, I probably was 12. It was in the city. Mm-hmm. And I am not a Catholic, but I was raised Catholic when I was younger. So no. I, Sicilian yeah. raised Catholic? Who would have thought? Oh. <laughs> uh, but I walked into the temple and I'm like, where's the holy water? Like my cousin and I were trying to look for it. And we're like, maybe we should just do the thing. And You know, like... It's very funny because they don't have holy water. Like you know, you don't have to hit the thing going. And I'm gonna follow the sun yeah. and pay the bill. You know. Um, Why would you go the, into a Catholic church if not for the holy water? I, I was thirsty. That's the only reason I yeah. went. You know that that and the tugs. But uh, so um, <laughs> anyway, so your book is for kids. You were saying no. All right. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> it's a young adult, not not a middle middle <laughs> grade. Would you classify it as young adult? No, like if no. You- so so the 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 um, themes are of the first book. So it's the first book in a planned six book series, uh, Legend of the Amazons. So Maiden of Artemis is, um, and this whole series is about Otrera, the first queen of the Amazons, and it's her becoming queen. So um, some people might have the misconception that she's queen by the end of the book one, which is not the case. <laughs> so so um, book one has a lot of themes that are common with a young adult book with like loss of innocence and um, kind of finding oneself. Um, but Otra herself is more, uh, she's 20 years old, which I had to age up. I realized that that's not necessarily realistic with the time frame of how old she would actually be, but I'm not going to be writing that kind of book that would give me the ick. 
<laughs> the things that she would be doing if realistically she's probably 14, but what? no thanks. That's thank ridiculous. You. Send me that version. <laughs> so we're going to have to have a talk, Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> So the, the, the themes are a lot of um, loss of innocence and things like that, but the content itself is adult and the series is adult series. Um, but yeah, there's there's not as much violence and murder, but there is some murder. <laughs> there must be more. <laughs> I want to murder that hot. Uh, hey, just as a fun, uh, have you gotten uh, any uh, review or critique where... Uh, it was negative, but it was preferenced by, I don't like this genre and I've never read this book, these kind of books before. And then like everything after that shouldn't be even acknowledged. Right. But like, have you seen those kind of reviews? Have you gotten anything like that? Where they was just like, I don't read romance. And this book was all, was, everyone's it's kissing. Awesome. <laughs> You're just like, well, why romance. would you even leave it? Um, I don't off the top of my head, I, I have seen reviews like that. And off the top of my head, I haven't received a specific review like that. Um, mm -hmm. I've, I feel like I've had um, some, I don't remember if they're actually bad reviews. Um, all reviews to me are good reviews because you've read my book. And I just am like, wow, you read my book. That's amazing. Cash um, to check. <laughs> Um, Give me all one stars. What do I care? But I have had reviews where they're like, I don't know anything about Greek mythology, and you know, this was confusing or didn't make sense or anything like that. Yeah. So, did you get why did she spell Zeus with no O's? God, Zooks. <laughs> Zeus. <laughs> I need more O's. Zeus. <laughs> I am. Um, Lord Zeus. <laughs> um, uh, it's too much fun to say. <laughs> You're gonna be like, nah, every time I see it in the book, you are gonna be like, Zeus. <laughs> Good thing his name doesn't appear like at all in the book. <laughs> well, well, there it goes. My uh, prequel, though, my prequel will have will have him. He's he's in my oh, prequel. Right. That's, so. that's fair. That's fair. I'll make sure I, to spell it with like five O's just for you. <laughs> it's just someone calling him. Zoot! Yeah. Um, <laughs> I have a character named Larabahi in the book. She's a, she's a goddess of wisdom. Lamborghini? Uh, no, <laughs> close. Very close. Not She has gas when she eats greens, but not <laughs> gas to keep her going. Uh, no, but uh, she's she's an eagle goddess or whatever. You know, she's like a nature goddess. But, uh, uh, you know, because medieval. Thing. Anyway, uh, one of my friends was reading it, and uh, she, she she calls me up. She goes, I just want to say, la <laughs> so, <laughs> She's like, I couldn't stop. Every time I saw the name, I just got me going, la <laughs> And I'm like, why? And she's like, it just feels right. I'm like, you ruined it for me. And now every time I read her name, I'm like, la <laughs> la I saw a, a reel the other day made by somebody else. So Otrera is um, the, the premise of her being like the first queen of the Amazons isn't unique to me. I went and was doing research and I found this name and it just said, Otrera, first queen of the Amazons. I was like, cool, obviously that's my main character and kind of went from there. So there was this reel that was talking about her, but pronounced it Otrera. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, Thanks. I hate it. We won't be doing that. Please. Oh, dear. oh yeah, because all of my characters are gonna be like, oh T Ray Ra. Oh dear. Uh, oh, dear. uh, uh <laughs> Brandon Sanderson says one of the best things when asked about it, because he had a question once and the guy the, the kid was like, uh, he was a young kid. He's like, Mr. Sanderson, uh, do you pronounce the name? And he goes, Let me stop you there. Because as soon as you buy the book, I, you can call them whatever. They are your characters. You can call them whatever you want. I, I have name. I call them a certain name. I don't expect anyone else to see them the same way. And I was like, oh, interesting. Uh, with that said, I named my main protagonist Devious. 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 A great name. I like. That. And he's the hero. That's awesome. 
It's but what you see in the dark? Moron. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it, it is. He, he, yeah, it's a moron. He's neither an ox or a moron, but I understand. No. <laughs> that's good. Uh, uh, but people are like that. That's not going to be a good name. And then like they'll read the book and like that's a great name. Like because it, you start seeing it and it's not the word devious. It's like yeah. the name devious. Uh, so I do that all the time. I have another character named Corgan Mosley. His last name's Mosley, so he's Mister Mosley. I like that. Right. Right. So and then uh, I, I have weird ones too. Like I have a character named Tentative. You know, like the word tentative. But. It, and they're just like, how is that a good name? Why is that name working? And I, was like, I don't know. <laughs> I had, I was, I was when I was in middle school. I was trying to write a uh, elf story, and her name was Apostrophe. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, that's so good though. It shouldn't be. Like but elf, it's good. You can use it. <laughs> Apostrophe. Apostrophe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here's. <laughs> Here's some fun name ones because uh, you will get the Easter egg. I have two supporting characters who are lovers named Lysandra and Demetria. Oh, there we go. We got some uh, Shakespeare stuff going in there. Right? I had to sneak that one in there. You got, look, everybody needs a Demetria. So (laughs) they're like two of my favorite characters. I hear they love each other. They do. Uh, but it is a young adult, so the most you get is over the clothes uh, touching. Oh, it's an adult, but it's Uh-oh. a slow burn. So we're lo- losing our innocence. We're having some like self exploration and some dreams in the first book, and then things are gonna get spicy. Um, I may oh, or may God. not be about to write a scene with an orgy between <laughs> <laughs> my troop of women and a couple of the gods. <laughs> If if you need help, I'll I'll read that for you. No, uh, I had a I had a friend read. Stay in uh, line. <laughs> in line. Well, actually, uh, I'm going to write it very spicy, and then copy okay. paste it into a different document. Tone this one down to a two spice, two two chilies for the two end chilies. product, and then have the five star spice for like a oh. Are you a freak? Subscribe <laughs> <laughs> to my newsletter. The freak edition. <clears throat> yeah. The freak edition. Uh, in in uh, I you know I have uh, I have other books that I'm working on stuff, but uh, there was a scene where it gets pretty spicy. You know, like it's like, yo, what's happening there? You know, uh, there's some tying up. There's some uh, you know special areas being played around. It's not French <laughs> kissing, if you know what I mean. No, it's not no French kissing. It's French in nature, but it's not French kissing. Mm. Uh, anyway, so someone writes, but it, but uh, the way I write that stuff, I don't get to. Uh, you you save not, all your graphicness for the violence. For the violence, yeah, the violence. We're not we're, and, not, uh, we're not focusing on the and anatomical terms. It's more yeah, yeah, poetic. Yeah, yeah. I don't make up fake like the the cavern of passion was erupted by Velvet devastating steel. <laughs> yeah. his sword was in his hand but it was not the blade of steel plunged you know? to the hilt <laughs> <laughs> these aren't <Yeah>. mine <laughs> that's the worst part <laughs> they're out I there feel weird down there um so anyway so someone wrote, wrote me back and they go, look, this is really great, but I think you should like be more descriptive with it. You should really, you know, like get it into the down and dirty. And I was like, why? And they're like, well, I really like erotica. I go, okay, well, this is not the book for you. Then. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, but if you're going to do sex, you might as well just go all in. I go, look, that's what she said. No. But I, but uh, <laughs> that is what she you said. know, I, I, I can't do that is not the book I'm writing. And they're like, I, I, and they're just trying to convince me that the best way to go is just to, you know, no. start. Uh, they're like, and you should become descriptive with it. You know, like, like the love. The uh, I go, what a diphthong. Like, I'm not. You know, like yeah. his love diphthong. You know, <laughs> two vowels next to each other, making the sound of the original vowel. Anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> ready writers out there. Uh, not authors, writers. Um, no, but anyway, uh, but it's fun. It's fun getting people's. Uh, 
that's the hardest part I think about being an author and giving your work to someone to analyze is like you get back like their version of the story and not like their experience in the story. And you're like, yeah. I don't need you to tell me you want to know what their work schedule is because that is unimportant to the narrative. Yeah, yeah. but I would really like to know like how I go, they're a slave. They have no work schedule. They work, they are in work form at all times. <laughs> And they're like, they don't get breaks? Well, yeah, like they have to raise their hand, they get a chicken and or whatever, you know, a little thing, and they have to sure. go put it in like a pee pee. But like, you know, other than that. How is that relevant? Yeah, like why do you, you ever get like like answers like that from like your beta readers or alpha readers where you're like, what's this, that's not even the story I'm writing. Like, why do I gotta, you, you need cars. You know, you know, Eloise, I, <laughs> I like this scene, but like I'm imagine- like, Walking everywhere. Like, yeah, what if, what if the carriage had like rockets on the back and they were like, I don't know, because there's gods, they should be in space and like, oh, Mars, you know, because Mars is wrong gods, wrong yeah. gods. Yeah, yeah, it's not a sci-fi. Um, definitely a uh, thanks, we won't be doing that kind of um, response. Um, if I have had those responses, I don't remember them because I'm, uh, what's that? Ooh, I should know the singer before I quote the song, but it's a, uh, if you can't please everyone, you might as well please yourself. Like, <laughs> I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not writing for, you know, yeah, I'm writing for a beta read. Be ideally, the beta readers are like target readers, but yeah. which is why, you know, if all, if all five of them are saying, hey, we want more in this one section or this one parts confusing or whatever, then yeah, I'll consider changing it. But if um, kind of that uh, you were talking about the person who was reading the scene and they were getting like anxious or whatever. And it's like, yeah, that's the point. So there's complaints that people will have. And it's like, yeah, that's the point. It's not really my fault that you seem to be missing the point. That sounds yeah. like a personal problem to me. <laughs> but they're also validating your goal, yeah, like exactly. Uh, yeah, because because I always have alpha readers and beta. Alpha readers are just there for the functionality. Mm -hmm. I go, I, please don't pay attention. That I, there's no immersion in this version. Right. It's just foundational. Do the characters make sense? Does the plot make sense? You know, the, yeah. does it feel too rushed? Whatever. But once the beta read, I go, listen. All I want is your experience. I don't want your input or insight in the version of the book you want. I just want you to tell me if you're enjoying it, if uh, things feel too rushed, like does the does the romance make sense or feel like it's just there? Uh, did the payoffs pay off? Did, mm -hmm. like, that's all I care about. Like, How do you feel about the experience? I don't need you to tell me, you know what would make this scene better? Nothing, because I already did that work. <laughs> I'm not adding a new scene I already know the narrative works. I right. already spent time with those people. Right. You know. So do you, when you get your beta readers, do you have like a set set of questions that you send to all the beta readers? Yeah. Nice. And uh, I, I actually generalize. So uh, I use the 27 point outline. I'm sure you've watched some of my books on my mm -hmm. outlining process. And uh, so what I do is uh, I send them all the chapters to a section and there are nine sections in a narrative. Uh, and each section has three plot points. So if you do the math, it's 27 plot points, right? Mm -hmm. So I'll send them section one, and then I'll have questions that are sort of dedicated to section one. Like the, it's basically the introduction of the ordinary world, the inciting incident, and the reaction to the inciting incident. So, but it also has other things like the world, the world has changed because, you know. Uh, but anyway, <clears throat> uh, so those questions are very specific to sort of like that element. But it's only like maybe three or four questions. And then I have a what are your thoughts mm -hmm. kind of like question. Like uh, but I do point. have leading questions because I want to make sure certain things are there. But I don't mm -hmm. want them to know what it is. So I might say something, for example, in, in the fantasy book I'm working on, a question might be like, um, what, what, oh, what do you think the story is going to be about? So I always love starting out off for the ordinary world because... Again, it is supposed to be subverted. So I want them to see it as one thing. Mm -hmm. And then by the time they get to the end of act one, I ask that question again. Now that act one has ended and concluded, 
uh, where do you think, the sto- what is the story about now? And then they're like, oh, it's, you know, completely. So uh, that's how I base my questions is specific to that. But I always like that. What are your thoughts? But don't give them too many because then they're like, I don't want to read because then I yeah. have homework. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You know, but but if you give them like a chunk, like, for example, section one for me is like 10 chapters. Right. But section two is like four chapters and section three is maybe uh, six chapters. And then so that's act one, you know, and then so it's not too uh, not like Wait, reading. act one is how many chapters? <laughs> well, the, the, the book is uh, the book is 74 chapters altogether. And each each act is about 20 something chapters. Uh, with the variation between, I feel like your chapters know. are shorter than my chapters. <laughs> no, they're. Uh, Wait, how long? Separate your... fantasy. Separate oh. fantasy. So. Oh God! How long are your? How long? What? How long is your average? What's your average word count for your chapters? I can tell you. I have my document open because I was working on it. Uh, in the zero draft, that's before I did any like work work. Uh, it's about twenty eight hundred words per chapter, but in the. Uh, <laughs> but in the target. Book. Well, yeah, it's it's a big book. Uh, in the in the final the final version of it, it'll we're probably going to look at forty two hundred words per chapter at, on average. Uh, however, uh, I have chapters that are say two thousand words, and then I have chapters that are say seven thousand words, and the reason is because they're battles. Mm-hmm. So a battle is obviously going to be a longer chapter than yeah. you know two people you know Talking. pulling each other's toenails or whatever you know. <clears throat> You know, because it's a romance. Uh, yes. It's not romance. Um, so, but it is epic fantasy. So, right. you know, uh, you know, with uh, somebody's actually reading the last, the end of the book, and they just got to the, like the la- there's a there's ten chapters to the end of the book. That the 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 ninth section of the book is ten chapters, mm-hmm. and they just read five chapters, and they text me. They go, we have a lot to talk about. These chapters, these, I can't even, these, these are great. These are, I did not expect any of this. Like, that's the kind of like, that's that's what I want. You know, like, I want, oh, this is, they're like, everything about these chapters was perfect. And I was like, all right, great. great, great." That's great. (laughs) The only two things that people ever call me about is one, to be mad at me about what I did to one character. And the next is to be mad at me that the second one's not done yet. <laughs> They're well, like, fair, I've fair. got a bone to pick with you. You did this. How dare you? And then what was the one coming up? <laughs> did I complain and, that you aged her up? I want them to be dirty, it's like my brain, because I'm a filthy. No. <laughs> no. I haven't. Honestly, I don't. The, the, the two scenes are just so small and short. And I don't really get as dirty as book two is going to be. Um, but uh, my dad was like, why didn't you warn me? Because <laughs> the first of the scenes is a uh, uh, the young woman uh, with some self-discovery. Um, oh, and he's just oh. like, why did you ma- why did you let me read that? Why? And I'm like, sorry, dad. And then his mom, my Nana, is like, that was a damn good book. <laughs> so when you say self discovery she learns that she has underarm hair. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Yeah, because yeah. back then they wouldn't shave anything. They have hair on their feet, their legs, mm-hmm. underarms. Yep. The the, the hoo-ha. Um that's fair. That's fair. The, the, the self discovery of um innocence. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it goes in. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Except for I'm so mean to her every time, like in in both scenes, uh, she, uh, things get interrupted <laughs> oh, okay. by animals. The animals are like, "Hey!" Does she <laughs> lift her hand up and say, "Hold on!" And then just. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I got you to start. That's all I care about. <laughs> <laughs> See Alloways and I every Saturday. No, all right. Um, I you know I do get some. There there is there is a character that everyone really loves, but that character gets the short end of the stick, and they're always they, so so far. Someone calls him the cuckinator. Like, what Aww. are you doing to the cuckinator? Leave him alone. 
the, the, the cookinator. And then that, oh, and my other favorite thing is like, after people read so many chapters, they're always like, why are you going to kill this character? Off? And I go, what do you mean? They're not dead. And they're like, all I see is death. You know, the triple dog dead. That's all I see. This person's triple dog dead. And one person said about the cuckinator, there's like this crazy scene that happens. And they're like, how dare you? How dare you do that to the cuckinator? Now I know that guy's going to die. And he, I don't want him to die. What, does I'm he like, start like talking about his dreams, his hopes and dreams? <laughs> Is that what? <laughs> no. It, like after the war, we're going to get a farm. You know? Uh, let me put it into perspective. Imagine, this has nothing to do with the scene, but just okay. as an example, imagine, okay, you're the cuckinator. I okay? am the cuckinator. You are the cuckinator, and uh, uh, and uh, or the cuck queen, right? And you are the cuck queen, right? So you are you are bringing this beautiful black duck, okay, okay, to the woman of your dreams. You're like, hey. I got you this duck. Perfect. Right? And then the other person shows up with like a dragon as a gift. Oh. I worked so hard <laughs> on getting that duck. Yeah, exactly. Like, I, I finally learned how to handle the duck. And then so I have a dragon for you. Not that that's the scene, but that is the equivalent. <laughs> it's like, I work, and you know, they have a nice moment, and, and the person's like, well, you know, that's. Why you I like your duck as a friend. friend. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're the best friend duck. Oh, a dragon. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I like that poor guy. But, uh, and but then as I sings, tell everyone. And then he sings, uh, Cuckinator sings Eponine's song from Les Mis. <laughs> no, he goes, it's not easy being green. <laughs> On my own. <laughs> oh, the poor cuckinator. Um. Anyway. <laughs> so, all right. Uh, oh, it's one thirty. Oh, you you have you have uh, things you have to do. I, I believe mm -hmm. we we have to get you a heart out. You were saying. My toes. That's right. Uh. Uh. So uh, how do people find you? And, and keep in mind, you do have to spell stuff because there will be people oh, yeah. listening who are not able to watch the YouTube. So go ahead. Give, give them your sure. details. Um, uh, <clears throat> you can find me and all of my links at my website of EloiseBar.com. So E-L-O-I-S-E-B-A-H-R.com. That's my author website. If you search author Eloise Barr on Instagram. I hope you know how to spell author. Um, <laughs> W-R-I-T. Um, and then on YouTube, I have a channel called, I think it's Eloise Barr Writes or something. Just type my name into the search and uh, I'll probably pop up, uh, I hope. Okay. <laughs> I guess the question is, do you choose do you choose a man or do you cho choose the bar? You know, if you're in the woods uh, and you see a random man or a random bar, who do you oh, choose? The bar. Yeah, you got to choose the bar because you get all the uh, mythology stories. You get a you get a pink cover, yep. right? It's pink and purple. Is that correct? Pink and yep. purple. Oh, you want me to hold it up for our yeah, viewers? Yeah. Woo! Look, woo, woo! Look at that. Oh, blurry. It's <laughs> oh, it's <laughs> OT Ray Ra. <laughs> So you know, Zeus is not gonna be happy with that. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right, so there it is. Uh so yeah, that's it, everybody. Uh we'll uh, talk to you next time. And remember, as always, keep developing the right mindset. Bye. Bye.